The Something You Should Know podcast today is sponsored by Audible.com. If you haven't tried an audiobook yet, you really have to. And you can do it for free. Just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K and you can get a free 30-day trial to their service plus one free audiobook download of your choosing. Just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Today on Something You Should Know, a simple way to get people to like you instantly. And it just takes four simple words. Plus, air travel. Who hasn't gotten on an airplane and thought about the possibility of the plane crashing? The big misperception is that if you're in an airplane accident, you're going to die. 95% of aviation accidents do not have fatalities. But when airline disasters do happen, why do they happen? You will often hear that most accidents are the result of pilot error. I don't buy that. I think it's an overly simplistic understanding of air accidents. Aviation journalist Christine Negroni, author of The Crash Detectives, will be my guest. Plus, things that have been part of our lives for decades are suddenly disappearing. Keys, manual transmissions, and several other things will soon be out of your life forever. All this today on Something You Should Know. Something you should know. Fascinating intel. The world's top experts and practical advice you can use in your life today. The Something You Should Know podcast with Mike Carruthers. Hi and welcome. And I know in just about every episode of the podcast so far, I have been uh, asking you politely to please leave a rating and review on iTunes. It really does mean a lot. If you just have a moment, you need an iTunes account, of course, but if you have a moment to just head over to iTunes and find the podcast, something you should know, and and just take a moment and leave a rating and review. Your one little review means so much. It, It really helps a lot. So if you would do that, I would certainly appreciate it. Now today... Whatever happened to the office key? It seems like hardly anyone anymore has an office key. Most people are now issued a key card or a fob or a chip to get in and out of the office or the building. But the office key, well, that's pretty much extinct. And it seems that there are a lot of other things that have been part of our lives for a long time that are also disappearing and will soon be extinct as well. We'll be discussing that coming up, plus air travel. Despite being told that air travel is the safest way to travel, we all worry about how safe the flight we're on actually is. Aviation journalist Christine Negroni has a new book out called The Crash Detectives. And she'll be taking us behind the scenes in the airline business and discussing just how safe it really is and what your responsibilities are to keep yourself safe. And first up today, a very simple way to get people to like you. And it's this. The next time you meet someone and they tell you what they do for a living, try saying these four words. Wow, that sounds hard. According to writer Paul Ford at TheMedium.com, that phrase is the key to politeness. Why? Well, because nearly everyone in the world thinks their job is hard. And by you saying that, that you think that sounds hard, you express empathy. People like you more when you express empathy. Empathy is considered by many psychologists to be essential to cooperation and problem solving and to human functioning in general. Researchers have described empathy as the social glue binding people together and creating harmonious relationships. And by you saying, wow, that sounds hard, It's also a great way to get the conversation going because it invites the other person to respond by explaining just how hard their job is. And that is something you should know. So like you, I have heard how safe air travel is, but I also see the stories about planes crashing into mountains or going missing or some horrible airline disaster And I especially think about it when I get on an airplane, especially when I'm sitting on an airplane and it hits some turbulence. That's when I think about it the most. So is air travel as safe as we're told it is? Let's find out. My guest is Christine Negroni. She is a journalist. She's written for the New York Times, and she has a a brand new book out 
called The Crash Detectives Investigating the World's Most Mysterious Air Disasters. So welcome, Christine. And and are people's fears warranted? Should we be worried when we step on a plane? I mean, even if crashes are few and far between, if it happens to your plane, you're pretty much done. No. I mean, yes and no. I'm going to argue with the second point, but let me answer the first point first. Is it worth thinking that? I don't think there's anything you and I can say to, to, to change anybody who is going to be thinking along those lines Anyway, I agree with you. I think people step on an airplane and they do immediately start to worry about, you know, what's going to happen. And they definitely do when the turbulence comes. But the second part of that is, is, the, big, is the big misperception is that if you're in an airplane accident, you're going to die. Ninety-five percent of aviation accidents do not have fatalities. The problem is we don't hear about them because if you're in a an airplane and they have to land, you know, with the with the nose gear up, and, you know, and you scrape your way across the runway, that's an accident. If you land and you, you know, and you damage, you land hard and you damage the gear, that's an accident. Anytime the airplane is damaged. Um, or someone is injured, that's a turbulence event in which somebody flies up and hits the ceiling, that's an accident. So we, there are many more accidents that we don't hear of. But the ones we hear of, of course, are the ones where the plane, you know, plows into a, into a mountain or, you know, Malaysia 370 where a plane disappears. So I think we have a very distorted view of survivability. You're much more likely, with those numbers, you're much more likely to be caught with your seatbelt off, you know, hitting the, the roof of the airplane in a turbulence event. The significance of that to me and to anyone who travels uh, by air is that those flight attendants are not just beating their gums up there. They're telling you things that you should know because these are ways you're going to be healthier or you know, more likely to survive in a disaster, in an accident. So, you know, that to me is the takeaway is that when they tell you, uh, you know, don't get your things out of the overhead bin. If there, we have an emergency, just jump on the slide and get out of the airplane. Don't stop and grab your stuff. Don't, you know, take off your shoes. Um, you know, put on your seatbelt. Put your seat back up. When they tell you to do those things, it's because there's, re- there's a good reason for them. Yeah, I think people are surprised to learn that flight attendants and the flight crew are, are not just waiters and waitresses, that they're actually trained for just those kind of events. And since they're there, they serve food and beverages, but that's not what their training and purpose really is. Yeah, it's true. Uh, though I will say that I, there's a lot of that is sort of the result of airlines trying to, um, and they don't do it so much anymore, but airlines for many, many years really did want to sell you on their flight attendants for a variety of other things. And they do spend a lot of time talking about the service and, you know, they do, they do pitch their airplane for everything, to, uh, pitch their airplane to, um, you know, to their audience for everything but the safety. Um, so to some extent, we have been we have been raised to, right. to believe that's what they're there for. Is it true that um, that most ca- at least catastrophic accidents happen either at takeoff or landing? That that rarely it, it does a plane just fall out of the sky. Yeah, but I think there's I think there's sort of logical reasons for that, um, and and in fact I think statistically the, it's heavier towards landing than it is towards takeoff. But the reason for that is to me quite obvious that. Air, but pilots don't take off if they have a problem. They, you know, they, they, they check everything before they take off. And they can still even abort a takeoff if something doesn't appear to be right or, you know, if, if it's early enough in the takeoff roll. But every plane's got to land. Every plane's got to land. So if you find that, 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 that accidents are clustered towards the landing, that means that whether they had an issue or not, they still had to put that airplane on the ground. So at cruise, no, you don't normally see a lot of uh, of catastrophes happening. But 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 lately there have been a few. Uh, there have been a few of it, like the Air Asia um, accident in outside of the Philippines, or maybe it was Indonesia. It was Indonesia. So they do happen that way. But no, I, I you know I don't think we should take away too much from those numbers. I don't think they're particularly illuminating. They're more logical than anything else. When planes crash. Why do they crash? Is it normally a mechanical problem, or is it normally a, a human error? Or in, in, in big general terms, when when there's some big disaster, what happened? Well, you will often hear that most accidents are the result of pilot error. I don't buy that. 
I don't think that, I think it's an overly simplistic understanding of air accidents. There is a famous saying in the world of aviation safety that an accident is the result of an unbroken chain of events. And if you break any part of that link, you will not have the accident. Now, in my book, I talk about um, all, you know, about the Sully phenomenon and how people say, well, you know, he was just this this un- unusual and unique pilot who saved the day. But it's not. I don't believe that's the case. I think that every day, on almost every flight, the pilot does something to break that chain. They they correct things without ever realizing that had that gone uncorrected, it might lead to the next link, to the next link, to the next link, and therefore to disaster. So I think that human component is extremely important. I don't say it's you know it always winds up being the pilot. The pilot might might have made the last link, might have made the last wrong decision after many other things went wrong. But they're not, you know, it, it, I think it's wrong to sort of make the conclusion that it's always, you know, that, that the pilots are largely responsible. Accidents don't have one cause. If you go back, and it's very, uh, it, you'll see in most of the, the NTSB, the American crash investigators will always say, well, here is the probable cause and here are the contributing factors. But there's a push underway now to eliminate the probable cause and just say these were the factors that contributed to the accident. Because it's very hard if it's not the last event to sort of give them their weight. How important was it that the airline had a policy in which you could only sit at the gate for 25 minutes, and that if you sat there for 26, you would have to go in and see the chief pilot. How important was that, you know, how, how effective was that pressure in causing the pilot to race through his or her pre-flight checklist? You, you can't weigh that, but it might have been a factor. So, you follow me? Yeah. And w- lately there have been stories in the news about, you know, pilots getting arrested for being drunk and all that. I mean, are, are pilots not what they used to be, or are we just hearing well, what's going on? No, I think that's also a factor of, um, you know, the news media reports it. I do remember back in the 80s, there was a big uh, couple of pilots, a couple of events in which pilots were caught um, with higher blood alcohol than they were supposed to have, or they were seen drinking in their uniform, some completely stupid thing like that. And I remember there were a lot of news stories at the time about alcoholism among the pilot ranks. I can't tell you whether alcoholism among pilots is greater than any other profession, um, is to statistically greater, but it is one in which I think that pilots would be less likely to report their uh, this problem because it would be career ending. There are programs out that the unions have to um, to help prevent that kind of retribution if a pilot admits that they have a substance or an alcohol abuse problem. Um, you know, but these are, I, I don't think that this is any greater. I don't think this is something we need to worry about. Remember, the pilot's not alone. In most commercial flights, the pilot is not alone in the cockpit. There's another pilot there. So it's, you know, they're monitoring. I, you know, I think it's, you know, more a matter of what's reported in the news than any real threat. How true is it now that really the plane kind of flies itself, that the pilot doesn't do what the pilot used to do? Planes have evolved from the days in which the pilots were real stick and rudder, you know, stick and rudder pilots to becoming managers of a complex complex system. The 787 uh, was described to me by one pilot who flew it as a computer system with wings, not even one computer, but a system of computers with wings. I think we need a new kind of pilot, and I think we're getting new pilots, uh, new kinds of pilots. I will often hear among pilots who are my age, and I'm in my late 50s, I'll hear them say, oh, you know, they've lost their stick and rudder skills. They're not like we were. And the fact is, I think they're not like they were, and that not necessarily a bad thing because the plane's not what they used to fly either. As they become more technologically sophisticated, we need a, a pilot whose whose skill set and aptitude is more along the systems management side. And until we get there, where that is the common route, I think we're going to be having problems in the evolution from the stick and rudder guys to the to the computer system guys. And as that moves forward, we may see hiccups, and those hiccups because. Aviation geeks have come out of the woodwork. The social media has allowed us all to sort of 
talk and you know to each other and 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 we're much more visible so i think aviation news is much more visible to the person who normally wouldn't have thought about it every day i get the condi nas newsletter every day there's news in there about aviation and i think you know on the news if somebody everybody's got their camera so if something happens on their flight they're uploading that to facebook or to twitter and then the network news is picking it up if it's interesting enough so we get kind of a a disturbing sense that things are really going awry more than they are. No, they're just being noted more than they have been, and they're being distributed more than they have been. I remember hearing and being pretty convinced that, you know, back in the 60s and kind of the glory days of flying, that most of the pilots came out of the military, and where do they come from now? Well, no, no, you're right. That's correct. And, and, and you have to say that that question depends on where, where you live. In the United States, we had, we had and probably still have more than in other countries, a very robust general aviation. Kids come in at, you know, 14, 15, 16. They learn to fly in their community airport. You know, there's programs, the Eagle program, where kids learn to fly. And then they, you know, then they become flight instructors. And then they become, you know, they get their, their uh, twin engine and instrument rating, and, you know, they sort of work their way up. But I spent, and I wrote about it in, in The Crash Detectives, I spent a week in flight training school at, with Lufthansa. They train their pilots in, in Arizona, and most of those students had never been on an airplane before they started training as airline pilots for a very prestigious European carrier. And Lufthansa is not the only one. Turkish also trains that way. I think um, you know, there's a number of other airlines that train. They're, they bring in people who have the aptitude for flying, and then they teach them to fly. At Lufthansa, they told me that it's harder to find a pilot-type personality. You can teach, once you find that personality, you can teach them to fly, but the personality you can't change. So I'd say that, you know, the way pilots come into the to the commercial aviation world depends on where they live. But now, you're right, you know, there, there is less, I think there's less coming in from military because there are more opportunities to learn to fly elsewhere. We're told uh, that one of the reasons that there's, you know, so much desire to find the, the, the cause of a crash and the black box and all this is because we learn from it. Do we really learn from it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you were to ever look, and let, let's just talk about the Sully, the Sully uh, accident for a minute. Take a look at, their, at the docket on that accident, and you will see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages detailing and 35 recommendations detailing ways that that, that that accident could have illuminated other weaknesses in the system. And that's just one, and fairly cut and dried, regardless of what the Hollywood movie shows, a fairly cut and dried investigation. But you learn all sorts of things. I talked earlier about this unbroken chain of events. You learn about all those links. Why? What? What? So, so an airline might not know. We talk, I mentioned earlier this the whole factor of um, tight turnarounds. You know, pilots and flight crews are told, "Look, get that, turn that plane around in 25 minutes. Get it back out. We want to be on time. Um, we're rated by how our on, on time performance and does that pressure cause flight attendants to to or or gate agents or ramp agents or anyone to work too quickly? They they may not even learn the answer to that." until you have an accident, you know, in which that becomes a factor. So it's just, to me, it is really just like when you teach, you know, when a kid learns not to touch the oven, you tell them, you tell them, you tell them, but when they actually burn their hands, all of a sudden they learn. I think the industry does learn that way. Air France 447, a plane that went missing on a flight from Rio to Paris, after that um, plane disappeared, there was a huge uh hue and cry. I remember I wrote about it for the New York Times about tracking airplanes more carefully. Why were we not able to know where that airplane was? And that was 2009. And then 2014 rolls around and we have Malaysia 370 a full five years later and the same questions are asked. So you have to say, are we learning from these accidents and are we acting fast enough on what we learn? And that might be even the larger challenge. Right. Well, I remember reading just the other day about um, some of the things that came out of the Sully accident that recommendations that have still not been implemented. Yes. 
Yes, that's, you know, and, and in the United States, that's a particularly uh, intriguing problem because the National Transportation Safety Board can can issue recommendations, but they have no power. The FAA has to actually do it. And for many years, I worked on an uh, FAA rulemaking advisory committee where we were talking about aging aircraft wiring. I don't want to put you to sleep by talking about it, but, but the point was everything we wanted to recommend, like how often wiring would be inspected and ways that pilots would operate, you know, systems systems and circuit breakers in the cockpit, every recommendation we wanted to make had to have a cost-benefit analysis associated with it. That's the way they make decisions. How much does it cost and what's the value? And you can't argue with that. You know, you buy a car, you decide, I want one with airbags. I'm willing to pay extra for airbags because that's your cost-benefit analysis. Well, the airline industry basically has to run the same cost-benefit analysis. But sometimes they think, well, you know, the risk of losing another airplane after Air France is not going to be so great. Oops. Oops, it did turn out to be great. How many hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent by the world community to look for the black boxes of Malaysia 370? Yeah. Is there in the technological part of this anything in the future that w- looks promising that would el- eliminate? Because, I don't know, the plane gets wrapped in a big cushy bubble, so if it crashes, no one gets hurt kind of thing. Or, or, or you know, once a plane goes down, it, 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 people are going to die. Well, I think I think the most I, I think the where the industry is going right now is to increasingly automated flight, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I can't I can't predict. I will say that after um, the Miracle on the Hudson flight, I talked to Sullenberger because it was great discussion. A, a book had come out, you know, basically suggesting that the airplane helped him out a lot more than than he claimed it did in his book. So they were these two dueling philosophies. And uh, Sullenberger's argument was um, automation helps in certain is- is- with certain issues, but it hurts in others. Or, you know, it solves some problems, but it creates new ones. And we have seen that. We have seen cases in which the pilots uh, lulled into complacency because the airplane is, and I'm using air quotes here, flying itself, but, you know, basically on autopilot, they have neglected to stay on top of the flight and flown ac- flown beyond their airport, as in the case of a, a Northwest flight that, uh, that, that flew over Minneapolis and, you know, f- and went on for another hundred miles. So, more automation makes it easier for the pilots to handle the workload. It also makes it easier for the pilots to check out of the flight and be somewhere else when they need to have their mind on the game. And look, did we not just see that with Tesla, with this new uh, uh, driver or pilot, driverless car or, 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 or driver assist car, where the where where and I, I and I'm just qu- quoting news reports. I don't know whether this is actually the case, but there was some thought as to whether the pilot was actually uh, the pilot the driver was actually watching a movie while he was on his, you know, a driver assist car. Why? Because the, the car is taking care of it. I actually have a friend who has a Tesla who told me he took a, you know, he'd been, he'd been driving the thing for more than a year. And then we went for a drive in a car, a regular car. He said it was exhausting. And he'd been driving since he was 11 years old. The car has basically removed his ability to stay on top of driving. That's really remember, yeah. Phil? That's a, that's an interesting point. Is that if if you're not responsible, it's easy to zone out and go think about something else. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, do you remember phone numbers anymore, or have you outsourced that task to yeah, your phone? Exactly. Right. Yeah. This is what automation does. So it's a real. It's a real. I, I, and that's what Sully is saying. And I agree with him. It's a real challenge. Will we catch up to it? Yes. In much the same way, we will have accidents. We will learn from them. But you can't remove the human, and you can't leave it all in the hands of the human. Finding this balance between machine or among machine, computer, human, that's, that's, the, that's the difficult part. Right. Lastly, from all of what you have uncovered, written about, reported on, and learned, what's a big takeaway? What, what do you think airline passengers either don't know that they should know or should be aware of or or what well i have two thoughts on that one is one is directed specifically to your question which is what should airline passengers know 
And I think what they should know is that there's a, there's a great big system out there for them to travel safely. But they have a role in their own safety. They do. They're not babies. They're not being, you know, as much as the airlines would like them to feel like they're being coddled, well, or not, <laughs> depending on what part of the airplane you're sitting in. But you, you do have your own responsibility to listen to the briefing, to look at where the emergency exit is, to count the number of seats to the closest exit, to put your tray table back and your seat back when you're told to, to keep your shoes on for landing and takeoff. All of these things will help you survive in the unlikely event of an accident. That's that's to me like the 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 the, the nitty gritty. If you're if you're flying, this is your responsibility to yourself and to your fellow passengers to be smart. But I think the bigger thing that people don't understand, and to me, I'm sort of a zealot on this matter. Everything that aviation has learned over a century of investigating disasters, everything it's learned can be applied to our lives in general to enhance our performance. Checklists. Who couldn't benefit from a checklist? Communication, post-flight and pre-flight briefings. Get in your car, and don't just get in your car, turn the key, and drive off, but check. Do you have enough fuel? Are your rearview mirrors set the way they should be? You know, do you have, have you had a service? All of these things. This is what a pilot does before he or she gets into the cockpit. And after you've done your, whatever that event is you wanted to do well, I'm giving a lot of speeches these days because of my book. After each speech, I should sit down and do a post-flight check. Did I do a good job? Did I engage the audience? Did I make proper eye contact? These are all lessons we learn from aviation. I call them, and I have a blog called Flying Lessons, but they truly are great lessons for all of us in enhancing our performance that come directly from aviation. The last um, LAX to London 11-hour sitting in the back row by the bathroom flight that I took, I I didn't feel (laughs) coddled. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't feel coddled at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I misspoke. I misspoke. Most most travelers do not feel coddled. No. You're right about that. <laughs> well, well, thank you for your time today, Christine. It's really interesting, and, and it's something I think everybody thinks about at some time, particularly when you're sitting on an airplane and turbulence is throwing you around. You worry about crashing and aviation accidents. So it's good to have your insight. Christine Negroni author of The Crash Detectives, investigating the world's most mysterious air disasters. Finally, today on Something You Should Know, things are changing. And as a result of things changing, some things disappear. Some very familiar things are about to disappear, according to Kiplinger's magazine. Get ready to say goodbye to, first of all, keys. Well, the office key is really already gone. Most people now use a a card or a chip or something. To get into your home, car, boat, or anything else, pretty soon the prevailing wisdom is that you'll be using secure software on your phone to open the door of your home or your boat or your car. Fast food workers are disappearing. Many have already been replaced uh, by kiosks and machines. And soon machines may be actually cooking the food in fast food places and also doing the dishes. Manual transmissions are disappearing. Fewer and fewer cars are available with it. Even the Ford F-150 pickup is no longer available with a manual transmission. Textbooks. Kiplinger says that by the end of the decade, all college textbooks will be on e-reading devices, and K-12 through is right behind. And finally, dial-up internet. You may have thought it was already gone, But it still does exist. As of 2013, the last time I guess anyone checked, 3% of U.S. households still use dial-up internet. But soon, it will be gone forever. A reminder, please, if you have a moment, to please leave a review of this podcast on iTunes. If you have an iTunes account, it just takes a second, and it would mean so much to me. And you could win a $100 Amazon gift card for doing it. Just email me a screenshot of your review after it posts to iTunes, and you'll be eligible to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Details are on the website. And the podcast today has been sponsored by Audible.com. For a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial to the Audible service, 
Go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. You can even choose my guest today, Christine Negroni's book, The Crash Detectives, as your free audio book download. Just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. I'm Mike Carruthers. Thanks for listening today to Something You Should Know.